Welcome back to ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters, the larger community, if you will. Um, millions in foreign payments going to Trump. Uh, we learned about this over the past month or so, and it's a hot item. And, and I say for this too, he is not qualified to be president for this too. Underline the word too. <laughs> With Cameron Hurt. Uh, Cameron is the program manager for Common Cause. And he can talk about this uh, because Common Cause is, is looking at so many things. And this is one of those issues. Hi, Cameron. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Jay. How are you doing today? I'm good. So, uh, and I'm interested in following up on all of these things. So uh, some of your issues, uh, just judging from the newsletters I get from Common Cause, is they're trying to protect us from scams around the election about voting trying to protect us from Republican scams on Article 5 of the Constitution, uh, constitutional conventions uh, that, that are dangerous um, and organized by Republican groups. Um, and we're talking about, uh, of course, uh, uh, the scams that Trump does, and we're talking about privacy and surveillance. I just look at the uh, various newsletters that I get from you guys, and there's at least half a dozen major issues that you are working on, and I really appreciate that. Common Cause is special, highly credible, uh, intense research, and great articulate power. We should listen to everything you say. So I'm going to listen to you now, Cameron. Okay, we, we need your rationality uh, in a world of increasing madness. So let's talk about the report from Jamie Raskin in the House. Yeah, um, really amazing Representative uh, Raskin was able to uncover that from four of Trump's 500 businesses, so this is only four of 500, so we're not even talking about 5% of Trump-affiliated businesses, but out of four of them, over $7.8 million has gone to um, foreign nationals or their entities. Um, they have done work within the Trump business. So if I could put it in layman's terms, Basically, what it means is while Trump was in office, his businesses profited exponentially from him being the president, not by word of mouth, but by what we think was a lot of quid pro quo, which we know he already stands impeached of. Um, so what we see is something to the tune of over $5 million of investments from Chinese officials alone, 5 million of the 7 million. Now, this is this is, this is breathtaking, too, because what uh, Representative Raskin's report also tells us is that this is only within the first two years of his presidency. Um, and so when we go back and we think about the first two years of his presidency, and we think how President Trump was, I would say, kind of saber-rattling us as the American people to be aware of China, to be distrustful of China, to know China as our, quote, enemy um, in democracy. So, but not so much of an enemy that he couldn't make 5.5 million plus dollars off of that. Um, and it's, it's things of staying at his, his, his businesses, staying at his hotels. We know that Trump, um, majority of these, of these, uh, transactions happen in New York, Washington, DC, and Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, I don't know what government official from a foreign nation needs to be handling business with America in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, we could assume, but we, we, we really can only speculate right now, so we'll keep it just a speculation. But if we look at even D.C. and we look at New York, what on earth were Chinese officials doing in two years to where they needed to spend $5.5 million on truck businesses and entities? And these aren't, it's not to say that these, these nations haven't been coming to New York and D.C. since, I don't know, the inception of America. What it's saying is Trump Towers have been here for a while, and we've been able to watch how they do when, when certain um, delegations are in town. We know that, you know, what they do when the United Nations is meeting in the main office in New York. These uptake in, in foreign entities staying in his establishments has skyrocketed enormously. And it's something that we should all be wary of. It's very interesting that you have in the top five of con contributors to um, Trump hotels and, and his businesses include Saudi Arabia, 
Qatar, Kuwait, and India. Uh, we know that Qatar, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia were all a part of Trump's crown jewel, what he wanted to be his full crown jewel accomplishment of the Abraham Accords. Um, we just wonder, was there any quick pro quo to that? Uh, the you know what that was? Let, me, let me answer that. Uh, right after his, uh, his term, uh, Jared Kushner got into a deal with Saudi Arabia for $2 billion. $2 billion. That's more than $7.8 million. Cash. Um, cash. Cash. And, it's cash. and, and uh, so, you know, exactly what was that about? That was transactional. And that was a payoff. And uh, let me add, too, that, uh, you know, in the case of the hotels, and I hope you can talk about this, it's not that they had thousands of people staying in thousands of rooms at Trump's various hotels is that they were overpaying by millions of dollars. If you look at Jay, the room it. rates, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, that's exactly it, what you just hit on the head. Again, keep in mind, this report only goes into the first two years. During that time, the United Nations as a full body only met twice. So that says the full body. These people are staying, and it's not hundreds or thousands of a Chinese delegation coming. We're talking about seven people, plus maybe at best 10 security guards because of American um, policy with foreign security guards being in. So these people are only in these Trump establishments for the better part of maybe 20 days at best. That is maybe giving really generously about nine days. But at best, they're in these Trump establishments for 20 days and they drop over $5.5 million. It, it, it just, and again, it gives the sense of impropriety that we've seen this entire time with Trump, whether it be things where he is praising murderous, villainous dictators um, who never in my life did I think I would see an American president stand for or whether it be things about him being willing to suspend parts of the Constitution. I say this to you as a Black man. I say this to you as a Black man who understands that at one time, the Constitution only represented me to be worth three-fifths of a person. For anybody to want to take away from the living, breathing document that is the Constitution, the living, breathing document that allows us to strive to form a more perfect union, we must all regardless of race, religion, creed, or sexuality, if we are American, we must have cause for concern and deep concern at that. Yeah. And that's only the top of the iceberg. You know, the 7.8 million that, uh, that uh, Jimmy Raskin's committee found, we, we know, I mean, it's a syllogistic you know, point of logic that it's going to be much more than that. Start looking at the two billion by looking at the years they couldn't get. Can you talk about that? The years they couldn't get. This is only a very limited report, even though it's 160 pages, I think. Uh, and that's astounding, isn't it? It's 165 yeah. pages, and it's a limited report. Um, and, and let's talk about the limitations of this report. One, it was not done with bipartisan effort, which means that we can expect that some on um, the Trump side of things uh, did what they could to obstruct and delay this report and to stop as much information as getting out. Um, a, a clear evidence of that would be when uh, Representative Comer became chairman of the committee, he stopped allowing for any information to be given and effectively shut down the, the investigation itself. Um, and we would ask why. We would ask why would Comer do that, especially if this seems like the same uh, representative who is wanting to, quote unquote, drain the swamp because he has no problem going after Hunter Biden, Comer doesn't. He has no problem going after Joe Biden on secondhand information. And what I mean by that is we know as of today that the crux of his impeachment inquiry into President Biden, his, his whistleblower, has now been indicted. But when you get great, what was it? He was indicted for lying. He was indicted for lying, for lying on Hunter Biden and saying that he had conversations and was told things that never happened. The FBI was able to determine. And, and again, important to realize that the FBI director isn't a, a staunch Biden supporter. Um, 
he is a moderate uh, conservative who found this independently. And But to bring that point back to what could be seen as obstruction, how can Comer be so gung-ho to go in on Hunter Biden and Joe Biden on what we now know is completely uncredible information, but to have documents, literal receipts, and statements and, and say nothing to see here, no harm, no foul. I, I see the conservative party use the term patriot um, a lot, a lot. And I am the, the proud son of a service member. And I, I love our nation. I love what we have the potential to become and what we're continuously fighting to be. And with that, though, I just wonder to my conservative counterparts, where, when did it become patriotic to start serving this special interest of foreign nations? And, you know, I, I, I frame this as a question to conservatives, but it is something that even Democrats and liberals must look at when we think about the corruption of, of uh, Menendez um, in the Senate. So, but really and truly as a, as a group that has co-opted, in my, in my opinion, the term patriot, when did patriotism come into serving the interests of Vladimir Putin? When did being a patriot become serving in the interests of, I guess I would say, um, um, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman in, in Saudi Arabia? When did that become the definition and, and the want for patriotism? Um, it, it is, it's really baffling and it's sad. It's sad, you know, because again, I am young, but I am old enough to remember one, what life was like before social media. I'm old enough to remember what life was like before 9-11, immediately after 9-11. Um, I'm old enough to remember what it was like before we went into Afghanistan and after. Same thing with Iraq. And these, all of these situations led to this wave. Um, and a few more, of course. But to know how the Republican Party really used to stand for traditional American values in the, in the most genuine way. I can't take that from them. They really did. And to see where they are now, some... Um, perverse, I'm sorry, some perverse bastardization of conservative, conservatism, it, it's deeply sad. You know, can you remind me of a piece that we uh, published not too long ago about the uh, hijacking of the American flag? Mm. Um, Donald Trump never appears without 57 American flags behind him. But all of those guys, while they're lying to us, while they're making completely un-American and unpatriotic you know, statements, they got the American flag behind them. What in the world justifies that? They're as far away from the American flag as you can possibly imagine. And they're throwing this icon on us. They hijack this icon on us to make us think that they really are patriotic, which is actually what they call a crock. Um, so, you know, I, I think it falls in the same ballpark as your comments about patriotism in general. Absolutely, because what this is, what this is at the baseline, when I say this, I'm talking about Trump's actions and his portrayal of, of American politics since entering the arena. But what this is, is nothing short than pure Benedict Arnold treason. And people may say that that's a very um, bold statement or let's say a very dramatic statement. But when we think about how much he has betrayed this nation to serve his own best interests, it's unmistakable, unfortunately. It, it, it's not a gloating matter. It should pain us all. Um, but you, you have to spin things if you, if you are all about yourself. You know, we, we in the political world, we're not, we're not dumb to this. He's only running to stay out of jail, period, full stop. To stay out of jail, that's what's going to best suit him. Um, but apart from that, and this threat that that brings to our democracy is, is constant lying, but it's not just lying one time. We're being bombarded over and over and over again with the lies that we don't know where's the lie, where's the truth. And I have this conversation with people when I tell people, you know, um, this is a lie. They're frustrated. They're not frustrated with me for pointing out the lie. They're frustrated because of the exhaustion that they have from believing something, getting emotional about it, and then saying, um, saying something very egregious, maybe ignorant, and then feeling like they have to backtrack now because, oh, they got the wrong information. And uh, I think a, an amazing example of that was I saw a story about a, uh, not here in Hawaii, but on the continent, a, um, 
a teacher who was a drag queen in his spare time at night, and he was fired. Um, the school district said that wasn't appropriate, or I'm sorry, the superintendent unilaterally said that wasn't appropriate. And one of the things that people, when interviewed about it, conservatives who agreed with it were like, we don't want that around our children. He can do whatever he wants in his personal time. Well, the pause right there was he was doing it in his personal time, but the headline read that a principal was a drag queen and people instinctually assumed that that meant he was promoting it and being a drag queen in front of and around his students, which was not the case. Well, this, this goes to a question of the press, doesn't it? The media, yeah. how well they handle this, how well they educate us, how well they report and continue to report on issues that are unresolved, such as this one. And then it becomes our duty as amplifier, as voice amplifiers, right, to start changing our terminology so we can unconfuse our general public. What I mean by that is I constantly have this conversation with my peers and my friends. When you're watching CNN, when you're watching Fox, you're not watching news. I get that, you know, some are more credible than others, but 24-hour news cycles are inherently dangerous. They make their money from news being sensational at the bottom line. Whether they have a conservative slant, whether it's an independent slant or a liberal slant, they need sensational headlines because they have to report on this stuff all throughout the day. You can watch the same story be reported literally 12 times in one day on one station. We must get into the, and knowing that that is entertainment media. Now, what our local news stations do at 8 a.m., what they do at 6 a.m., what they do at 8 p.m., what ABC News gives us every night at, at, at 6, at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, those are actual news programs. Those are there just to give you the facts and let you draw your own conclusion. But with 24-hour cable media, they're trying to convince you of a point of view. And what we've seen in that, I think, since the evolution of this has been a, a gathering into silos. You know, and if I could break it down in a very silly way, when I was growing up, it was like, okay, are you a Nickelodeon kid or are you a Disney Channel kid? Which one are you? And to be honest, as a kid growing up, that affected your personality. The Nickelodeon kids were a little bit more rambunctious, a little more do what they want, a little more say whatever they wanted off the top of their head. Disney kids were supposed to, you know, tell the line, be nice kids, like musicals and stuff like that. But again, this is ways that these two TV stations kind of cultivated a little bit of a cult-like personality. It's the exact same thing right now with 24-hour cable media. Well, oh, and it's worse. It's worse. It's not just repeating a, a point-of-view story. It's um, not looking for news beyond that, not giving us anything beyond that. And furthermore, looking for raw meat news, um, news that excites the passions. Um, and that means more viewers, more eyeballs more advertisers, it, more no. money. It's bottom line. It's driven by the right. bottom line. Right. And it's shameless, really. Uh, and it's, so, you know, for, it really is. And, and it, it's shameless because they do it at our expense. They do it at our expense. Um, they do it at, and, and not just, and with this one, it's the media and our politicians because we, the American citizens, we live with their decisions. We live with Rupert Murdoch's decision to prioritize his family staying hundred billionaires, I'm sorry, billionaires versus um, telling the truth so that we can come together. I'm, I'm fortunate enough, I currently and have for the past decade um, lived in Hawaii. I grew up though in Tennessee in the South. So I grew up in a super majority Republican state. I have grown up all my life around conservatives. I've had conservative teachers, conservative friends, um, conservative family members. Uh, but I've never seen conservatism so volatile, so void of reason and fact. And it's, again, it's deeply sad, deeply concerning. I, I would hope that eventually reason would give way. But as long as people continue to put themselves over the betterment of us, the community, we'll always get sold out. I think Nikki Haley is a great example of that. Now, don't get me wrong. I would love to see Nikki Haley win the primary, but for her to be very surprised at Donald Trump, um, kind of, I would say, uh, made insinuations about her husband not being around. 
as her husband is a service member in this nation and currently serving overseas, you know, God bless him and all who are serving overseas. But she said, you know, that should disqualify him for going at a service member. She was eerily silent, though, when Trump and MAGA alike went after John McCain. Not only was she silent, she ended up taking a position with him. Um, again, I'm somebody who grew up in the South. I have a lot of respect for traditional conservatism. Um, so John McCain is somebody who I think that we as all Americans, we can draw pride in. You don't have to agree with his policies, but I think he's an American that all Americans can find a point of pride in. And to see people like Nikki Haley be so, um, I would say, disgusted by who Donald Trump is when it's their turn to get the heat, but not say anything when they see it happen to other people's, that is the epitome of what's wrong with where we are right now. Well, what's wrong with we, where we are right now is going to continue, uh, despite um, you know the efforts of Common Cause and and Think Tech Hawaii. Um, and it's very troubling that we are finding you know we talk about a swamp, huh? You you peel it off, and there it is, and it's raw corruption. It's you know, all those animals under the rock, and they're they're all doing horrible things. They're all involved in transactional. We should have taken the transactional nature of Trump's withholding the $400 million, uh, from Ukraine back in 2017, but we didn't. He managed to get by that. He's gotten by so much. And, and what it all unfolded since then has been I, just eerie, just eerie that the nation that was around his first impeachment, the nation that was in need of these weapons, and Trump knew that they were in need of these weapons, and he probably understood now in hindsight the security threat that they were facing and the barrel that he had them over. And for him to push that, to try to get information on his, his political opponent, but then argue about a two-tier justice system, it, it, the, the, log the logic does not track. It's inconsistent as it is almost idiotic. You know, you've, you've, Kevin, you've talked about uh, China and the $5 million, you know, dollars that Trump earned, gotten, took, stolen, uh, erupted out of, out of the Chinese visitors. But what about, what about Russia? Uh, you know, we talk about Ukraine, and of course, it reminds us of Russia. I feel, and I wonder what your thought is, uh, that Trump is indebted to Russia and he's paying off a debt. Um, it's all transactional that he supports Russia in this war that he says he's not going to, um, you know, support Ukraine if he's elected uh, or if he takes power one way or the other. Um, and it just, it seems to follow a line of activity, uh, a lot of, a line of dots, if you will. And if you connect the dots, and the press doesn't necessarily do this, if you connect the dots, you find that he's, he's wedded at the hip with Putin. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think... Um... One, that is, one is so messy that I won't get too deep into speculation, but I will get into what's fact. And what's fact is that he has building permits in Moscow right now that went into effect the week after he became president. So we know that he has interest in building and in real estate in Moscow. Um, you could assume that that would be financed potentially through, through, through the Leave Golf Tournament um, that he uh, is working with with the Saudis. Um, I also think Putin has what Trump wants. One, Putin is older and fit. I think Trump would give anything to be a fit man. Um, he can't do anything more than lie about his weight and his height. I think Putin also has the respect of his people, but respect probably that comes from fear. Trump wants that as well. And he has a very homogeneous society that I think Trump admires and wants. Um, the way that they value uh, men and the way that men are looked at in Russian uh, oligarch society. Trump wants that. Trump wants that oligarch respect that he doesn't really get here in America. Um, well, because, and that's because we're a land of, our, of the free. And as much as media would try to say that we worship our celebrities and our um, you know, political figures, we're not as bad as, as many nations. So I think that he admires what Putin has. He wants what Putin has. He wants to be a democratically elected president for life, which is essentially what Putin is. I mean, this is a guy who has been um, leading Russia since before I was in middle school, I want to say. 
um, or right as I got in middle school. So he admires Putin. And I think that's ultimately what it is as far as in bed with. Absolutely. I think um, he's betting on Saudi Arabia and Russia to be very lucrative for him, seeing how he probably won't be able to do business in New York for very much longer. Yeah. And, and who knows um, exactly what, what the deal is with that hotel uh, in Moscow. Who knows what, what kind of money is going to flow into uh, Trump's pocket or, or already has tr- flowed uh, into Trump's Imagine pocket. North Koreans. Yeah. So, you know, uh, what, what, I, what I get out of this is that we know 7.8 million um, was found, that Jamie Raskin's committee, oversight committee found that that was inappropriate. Um, and we know that uh, there, there, there's an issue uh, over the, um, uh, the emoluments clause in the Constitution as to whether you should take money from a fi- foreign power. And uh, I don't think Trump is so clever that he could avoid a, a claim that he is in violation of the emoluments clause. Uh, and when you start to tally it up, it's in gross violation. The question really is, how much more is there? How can we find out how much more is there? And what do we need to do to find that out? Uh, like, uh, you know, the oversight committee. Uh, I would say, in yeah. closing, I would say that there's definitely a lot more out there. When I say we're at the tip of the iceberg, I mean, we're really at literally the bare tip and the rest is underwater rate waiting to be seen. Uh, what we can do is we can vote. We can vote. That is going to be how, and not just these presidential elections. No, I'm hoping that people saw how critically important it is to, to um, vote for your local senators or your local um, house uh, representatives, your county officials. All these people play a decision. All these people came into effect when it was time to um, effectively uh, correct President Trump when he served as president. But because we didn't have the right officials in, nothing was corrected. We can do this and we don't have to just go after Trump. No, we have to, we have to go after the entire system. And the family, I'm sorry, the family is involved. The family is a, is a conduit for some of these monies. I'm somebody exactly. who believes that you take one Trump down, the rest of the dominoes will fall. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so voting means ho- hopefully flipping the House. Flipping the House is where the investigation has been and should be. Um, so let's assume, let's assume one thing and another, you know, we have a couple of wins uh, in recent days, and maybe we will be able to flip the House to uh, uh, Democrats who will, who will reinitiate that investigation. We get Comer out of there. Comer is a fraud. He's, you know, he's, he's just working for Trump. Uh, he's, a, a, you know, just, just a follower. And so the question is, uh, how does that investigation go? Uh, what do they do first? What are they looking for? Uh, what, what, what might they find in what corner of the room? Um, and, and here's the thing. Suppose they find that it's not 7.8 million, which is bad enough. They find it's hundreds of millions. Eh? And Trump has been you know, aggrandized by hundreds of millions of dollars by, by his own corrupt and... Uh, 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 criminal efforts. Um, what do you do with that? How does that How does that work then once we find out lots more? I think that is going to be a question that we're going to have to address in that time. I had never in the history of America we had a president that has already 91 indictments. Um, so I think those are going to have to play out. I think if you are able to flip the house but you don't get the presidency, then nothing happens if Trump becomes president again. Now, if you flip the house and you keep the presidency, um, I think you may see a move by the Democrats to possibly wash it under the bridge, because like I said, there are 91 other counts. And I think what they're going to focus on is probably the most egregious of the egregious of the despicable, because there's so much to choose from. It's like a shopping mall of violations, just pick whatever store you want to go into and shop from. Um, however, if they do take it on, they will definitely probably, uh, not definitely probably, they will absolutely make sure that they have a seasoned Democrat head that committee. And I think there will be a push like we saw with the January 6th committee to have it be part bipartisan. Um, they're going to want at least one or one to three Republican voices on that committee so that they can have some validity in it. But I think that would be it. 
Um, I think also when this comes out, we may end up finding out that President Trump may have had more knowledge, uh, more situational knowledge, more understanding that certain situations in the globe or in the world right now today uh, were inevitable or would be happening, which may be also why he held onto some documents and kept certain friends. So what I think is more so not the money, but I would be interested to see in how much he knew about um, Ukraine. Yeah, it should be revealed to the public. It shall absolutely be revealed to the public. And to be honest, we should announce real charges. We should announce real charges. Um, if something is insurrection, it must be charged as insurrection. Otherwise, stop calling it an insurrection. If something is treason, make the charge for treason or stop calling it that. It's not just um, Trump's side who's dropping the ball on this. It is absolutely um, our, our entire system that really is kind of showing how weak we are to this. Yeah, so yeah, one, one other point I want to uh, extend with you on, we, we covered it briefly, is the policy point about why this is bad. Of course, it's bad under the Emoluments Clause, and it's bad as a matter of corruption. It's, it's, it's bad as a, a matter of keeping it secret. He would have kept it secret forever had the Oversight Committee not found it. He would never have said a word. Nobody would have known about it. Yeah? Um, and so you, you wonder uh, where the press is on this. Because this story uh, came out roughly a month ago, okay? So I saw it there. In fact, we had a talk show about it a month ago. Huh? Now Common Cause is, is on it, and Common Cause is doing stuff about it and making it public. But in that month, I haven't seen it in the media anywhere. So the media has not been following the story. And, and then you know, we've... And they won't because they, they've calculated that this is now Trump's fatigue. Another crime that Trump has committed, the general public doesn't care. The people who care already believe he's a criminal, and the people who don't are never going to believe it. So they don't care. And again, this is the problem when what you're after is profit and not actually informing us about what is going on and what intimate and perceived danger we may be in. Yeah, even if the story is that we, you know, we demand information, we're not getting it. Even if that's the story, people should know. The other thing and I want to deserve to know, we deserve to understand how the president of the United States is, or the former president of the United States is very close to several dictators or um, is, is best friends with the nation that created Wahhabism, which led, which led to the attacks of 9-11, you know, um, it's very interesting to find how he is in such good standing with these people while our nation and our people aren't in good standing with these people. This is a man who, who made it his, his business to ban people from pre predominant Muslim countries from coming in. Who was left off of that list, though, was the nation where majority, and I mean majority, I'm saying at least 90% of the hijackers of 9-11 came from Saudi Arabia. So all of this has been very um, concerning because all lanes point to something potentially bigger. But we can only speculate that that is not fact. But what is fact is that a former president is facing 91 criminal indictments. Yeah, and, and the point I, uh, I think that follows from that is if you have somebody who, who has been receiving this under-the-table money Call it bribes, because that's what it is. If I, if I pay you 10 times the value of a room in the Trump Hotel in a place where uh, no, no uh, a diplomat would go, no, no representative of China would go. I mean, I've seen that hotel. Uh, actually, what happened is it was on this side of the street, and I couldn't stand being on the same side of the street as that Trump Hotel. I walked on the other side. <laughs> and it's right in the middle of, you know, of the gambling district, the center of Las Vegas. So really, what are, what are they doing there? But the, you know, the point it's is though that the fact that every country, a part of the Abrahamic Accords is a part of this report. It's yeah. very interesting. So anyway, so uh, the, the president gets this, he does this, he keeps it secret and it benefits him in, in terms of millions of dollars, maybe hundreds, maybe, maybe more than that. Um, okay. And then how can we feel ever that he is representing our interests honestly and yeah. faithfully. We, we can. And he did not fact, think it, that he is representing our interests. He represents himself. He does not even represent his family. That man represents himself. 
and he may be doing the bidding of those to whom he is indebted, therefore working not only for himself, but for them. And uh, I mean, I think it's, it's not an unreasonable possibility, uh, just logically, that he is working for them and against us. This is totally intolerable. And an individual with this kind of um, track record is not fit to be president ever. And I, I think it's really important that Common Cause is taking this up. Uh, I think it should be worked and worked and worked. Um, I think the intelligence agencies ought to go after him on this. I think the media, such as it is, ought to go after him on this. And good for Common Cause for going after him on this. It, it has to be something that, that feeds into the public decision-making when it goes to the polls in November. It has to be. It absolutely has to be. And you know what? To be honest, after 2020, this could look a whole lot different. I mean, not 2020, 2024, I'm sorry. Thinking back to when we first had to beat him. If Trump can be defeated again, I imagine just like we saw 91 indictments the first time he was defeated, we may see 91 new ones. And again, it, it's, it, it's horrible because it's framed as a witch hunt. But if there was no magic, there would be no witch to go after. Mm -hmm. If there was no room in the air that nobody could say there's a witch, there's a witch, there's a witch. These are all whole indictments that he has earned, that he has absolutely earned. And um, again, if he does not win, and again, I think he's betting everything on this, this next win. If he does not win this, this next election, it's over for him and it's over for the bag of losers. Yes, that's true. The stakes are high. And on the other side of it, if he does with the election, and he does, you know, continue this criminal corruption, um, then the message is it's okay to do this sort of thing. So it's not just Trump we're talking about. It's all his polites and all those who watch him, not not only here up domestically, but Gates. elsewhere. Yeah, Matt Gates win. Lauren, Lauren Bur Boebert wins. Marjorie Taylor Greene wins. Um, Comer wins. Uh, we have, we have, uh, Alex Stone wins. We have so many people who need Trump to win in order for their careers to keep going. Uh, un, un, unknown. We don't even know who they are, but we yes. know that they will follow him in his footsteps and, and the American ethic will be changed permanently. So that's the dark side. That's the, uh, the, the, the ghost of no the experts. There won't be any experts a part of this administration, a part of his administration if he wins again. It will be nothing but yes men. Will do yes. exactly what he says when he needs them to do it. Yes. Why do I feel I'm a yes man? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Cameron. Cameron Hurt from uh, Common Cause Program Manager here, who I uh, I look forward to further discussions with you. I so enjoy your uh, passion and your, your Akamai way of looking at things. Thank you very much, Cameron. Thank you. You have a great rest of your day, and thank you for having me. Aloha. Well.